Today on Rainbow Country, my conversation with Sergeant Robert Chevalier, the 2S LGBTQ liaison officer for Toronto Police Services, continues. On this episode, we hear his thoughts on the removal of Toronto Police Services from the Pride Parade. That and more on episode 410. So stay tuned for Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi there, I'm Bennett Singer, a documentary filmmaker and the co-director of the new film Cured, which is currently available on PBS and on the PBS video app. You are listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Sergeant Robert Chevalier, hello. Hello. Uh, Welcome back to Rainbow Country. Uh, This is... Uh, part two of our conversation because we didn't have enough time last time so we're continuing on and going on you are a a police sergeant you are part of the lgbt community you are a a proud gay man you are also the the 2s lgbtq plus liaison officer there are two of you you are one half of that team and like i just mentioned we're going to continue our conversation today to talk about yourself, being part of uh, Toronto Police Services, being part of the LGBT community. I want to start talking about June, Pride Month, Gay Pride Month. For you on a personal level, as a gay man, does having a, a Pride Month, a Gay Pride Month, does this mean anything special to you in regards to having a month uh, known as Pride Month or Gay Pride Month. What does that mean to you as on a personal level as a gay man? So personal level, I, I think that it is extremely important. Um, I, you know, a week is good, but I, I think a month is really better. Uh, you know, I look at things like uh, Black History Month and I, I think sometimes to really take it in, I think we deserve a month first and foremost. And um, yeah, I think it it really a month is a good amount of time to really, uh, you know, showcase enough of events that we're not all, you know, there's many different, you know, two S LGBTQ plus, right. There's so many different components to that. And we want to have, you know, highlight as many different parts of the community as we can. And we don't want to have competing events and yeah, let's take a whole month and we deserve that. And uh, it's a very important to me uh, to be visible and to celebrate uh, what it is to be a member of the 2S LGBTQ plus community, as well as our allies and people who've come before us. Now, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that you have uh, a member of your family there who, yes, who's jumping I try- up and down on your lap. If people are watching this on YouTube, on the video, yes, who's uh-huh. joining us? This is my little cat, Joey. And whenever I am on any type of WebEx or anything else, he seems to know and he wants to be the star of the show. So Mm. I tried to get him down unsuccessfully and he's worked his way back up on my lap. So I have I have a company, I I guess, guest star, if you will. Well, hello, Joey. (laughs) Okay, I want to run by some dates with you. Uh, June 2000, Toronto Police and the OPP, Ontario Provincial Police, had squad cars as part of the the 2000 gay pride parade and that was at the very first that was the very first time that uh toronto police and the opp were part of a, a gay pride parade 2000 in 2005 the 25th uh gay pride parade bill blair became the first toronto police chief to march in the pride parade that was 2005 wow. and 2016, Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders apologizes for the 1981 bathhouse raids known as Operation Soap. That was 2016. In 2017, the pride flag was flown at police headquarters for the very first time in 2016. When was it that the trans flag was flown at at police headquarters. That was just a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, I want to say around 2019. And I can't remember if, it, I think it was at a T-Door event. So a Trans Day of Remembrance event was the first time it was flo- uh, flown at headquarters. We've also flown it. Um, so we uh, November 20th was the fifth anniversary 
of our flag raising at 51 for the Trans Day of Remembrance. Um, headquarters, I think, was a year after that. So uh, if my math is right, uh, we did it. We started it in 2018 and at 51 Division, and then 2019 was the first year um, at headquarters, I believe. So looking back at those dates, starting at, at 2000, when, uh, you know, a handful of cars were part of the 2000 Gay Pride Parade up to, you know, when everything essentially ended in, in 2016. Uh, what are your thoughts on the fact that there was that period of time when Toronto Police was part of the, the Gay Pride Parade? What are your thoughts in general about that, that period of time? So I think like in 2000, when, when you know, uh, the first officer uh, got into the parade, um, it was th that that person was very much welcomed by the community. Um, most members of the communities, I'm sure that there was a few people that that weren't crazy about having them there. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, within the Toronto Police Service, that would have been big news. You know, what are we doing going and participating in this? And, you know, we're supposed to be impartial, yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, basically homophobic, transphobic, uh, veiledness uh, coming out in comments like that, right? Um, and, uh, and then just five years later, uh, having our true leader, Bill Blair, being able to say, you know what? Yeah, let's, let's, uh, move forward with this and you know bring the bring the police service out of the dark ages bill blair uh had the the opportunity to hear him speak many times at lgbtq events he never shied away from what his involvement was at the bathhouse raids and and was quick to say that that involvement was wrong right and what they did was wrong um and so that was you know very uh really set the tone from a top down level uh, and that was in 2005. So we actually had pretty good momentum uh, up to about 2005 until about 2015 of of more and more police uh, marching and, and coming and celebrating each year. Um, I have personal thoughts um, and professional thoughts on the removal of, of police from Pride. And in fact, I actually talked to new recruits about um, you know when police were removed from Pride, right, um, and and the decision around that, and and where we were at, and you know I also now have the the uh, benefit of having hindsight, um, and also having more knowledge, more lived experience, uh, you know, a few years later. So, do you want me just to get into that now? I know well, your I, wanna, I know your question. Yeah, yeah. I want. I, I just want to take a step back in terms of uh, going back to two thousand and. Mm -hmm. uh, those 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 squad those squad cars, uh, yeah. Constable Judy uh, Judy Northworthy Northworthy, who's now uh, Des Ryan, um, and that uh, was so... one of the drivers. And OPP yep. officer Natalie Oska Os Oska Chody or something. I'm sorry, was... I'm messing up your name. N no, Natalie. that was the person Natalie. Yes, from OPP. Yeah, and um, those two individuals. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. um so. Uh, that person had uh, Noseworthy is the dead name now, but I could see how in mm. in, in in stuff uh, you would see, um, you know, so they transition then. Yeah, uh, transitioned while they were a Toronto police officer. Mm, well um, so before they retired, they transitioned. Uh, they were promoted to uh, sergeant and worked uh, detective capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they finished their career at the Toronto Police Service uh, or Toronto Police College, uh, mm -hmm. teaching recruits. When they retired so transitioned mm. and uh now it goes by uh, desmond ryan and is actually a crime writer and has written a few uh, wonderful books um about uh, crime writing okay so 2016 2016 toronto gay pride parade that year in 2016 the the honor group was black lives matter toronto they ended up yep. stopping the parade to make uh nine demands that Pride Toronto would eventually adopt. One of those demands was for the removal of police floats in the Pride marches and parades. Okay, so 2016, the Pride march stops. You are, were you a police sergeant at the time or a police officer? I was, yeah, I was a constable then. So 
when that happened, for you, did that come as a surprise? For Toronto Police Services, did it come as a surprise when it stopped, when the when Black Lives it, Matter Toronto stopped the parade? Did it come as a surprise? Yes, it came as a huge surprise. Um, at the time, it, it just was, you know, nobody had, we didn't, I was in it. Uh, my husband was also in it. Uh, he works at uh, the Ontario Nurses Association. So he was a different part of the parade. And we were all just kind of texting each other, like, what's going on? You know, we had limited information. And the police officer in me was like, you know, a broken float, or maybe something happened, like some sort of an incident, maybe medical or, you know, violence, who knows, right? Like, had no idea, we weren't really getting any information. And it wasn't until we were stopped for you know, a good while, like, obviously, I wasn't checking my watch, but it was, it seemed like probably at least 45 minutes. And then we found out that um, maybe half an hour, um, that it was actually a sit in. And then we started receiving information about that. But really, it was we nobody had an idea that that was going to be happening. So before that happened in 2016, before all that happened, was there ever any conversation between Pride Toronto and the Toronto Police Services uh, about maybe Toronto Police Services should take a step back because, uh, you know, members of the LGBT community, some of them might have been, uh, you know, contacting Pride Toronto to say, hey, uh, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable during the parade when I see, you know, law enforcement. Was there ever any conversation conversation between those two organizations, Pride Toronto and Toronto Police Services, before everything happened in 2016? As far as you if, you might know. Yeah, as far as I know, there was nothing. Um, my So at the time in 2016, I was pretty active with our, we now call it our Pride Internal Support Network. Back then, I think we were still going by LGBTQ um, or whatever uh, variation of the acronym that we were with at, during that time, because obviously evolved a lot over the last few years. Um, so, um, so it's pretty active. I had a good relationship with the then liaison officer. Um, nothing was communicated to us in terms of, um, you know, as far as I knew, we were loved and we were wanted in pride. And we certainly felt that way, to be honest, even when the parade did uh, resume, um, we, you know, continued marching. I didn't know about the demands. Um, and we all had fun. Like it was a great, great time, and people seemed to be, seemed to really like us there for the most part. Obviously, there was people that we know now that that didn't want us there, uh, but I wasn't aware of that at the time. So you mentioned earlier that you have some thoughts personally and professionally when it comes to what happened in 2016. On a personal level, what are your thoughts on what happened in 2016? So on a personal level, this I took it personally. This wasn't asking the police to leave the parade. This was asking Rob Chevalier to leave the parade. That's how I took it, right? Um, I wish that we had the leadership that we have today that could that would have been able to, you know, talk us through it, call in everybody, have a debrief, right? Recognize how much that would affect internal officers and talk to them and say, you know, this isn't personal. This, this Nobody wants you as individuals to be removed. It's an organization. It's because of, you know, so I took it very, very personal and, you know, kind of lashed out because I took it so personally. Um, when you take something personally, you feel like your back's against the wall and you want to, I think we have it in us, um, you know, as members of the community or marginalized communities that we want to speak out against injustice. And we felt um, at the time, I will own this statement and say I, I think I was misguided to say the least but I was I felt very betrayed and I felt like hurt and I took it very personally and I didn't have anybody there to sort of offer me a better context and sort of uh, you know uh, mentor me through that time um, and none of us did really right and so we we just went went forward like hurt people do. So you mentioned that you lashed out. How? How did you lash out? Or or did you like post certain tweets or something like that? Yeah. So what we did is like we basically weren't, we didn't feel like, I don't think 
anybody, like I said, I don't think anyone in in, our, in the Toronto Police Service uh, was had seen this coming, or if they did, they certainly didn't didn't think it would be a, a reality. Um, and basically, what we were hearing was just, oh, that's awful, right? And it's like, yeah, this is awful. This is horrible, right? And so we all were sort of talking with each other. Each of us had been directly affected by this decision. All of us had were taking it very personally. And we felt like, you know what, if, you know, if there was a personal attack on us, you know, let, what can we do about this? Right. Um, and so, you know, we, we looked at Pride Toronto and, you know, saw that the, the city of Toronto, who's our employer, um, is a huge funder of, of Pride Toronto. And we felt like, well, you know, why is our employer going to be giving money to this organization if we're not allowed to be in it? Right. And I'll tell you, that's how hurt people act, right? It's like eye for an eye, um, you know, you hurt me, I'm out for blood or I want to hurt you. And and we were just, I, I wish I could like go back to that group now as, as the person that I am and be like, let's bring it all in. Like everybody, come on in, let's have a big meeting. We're going to have a sit down. You're going to be heard. I'm going to hear the the hurt and the pain of your voices. I know how important and special this is to you to be able to do it. And here's the context. Here is the hindsight that I now have, right? Um, and, and just to help us walk through that, because um, we really felt like we were alone. Um, and we felt like this was something that was so special to, to us that we wanted to fight for, right? Um, and I think we just went about it the wrong way to be honest, like in hindsight. So anyways, we wrote a letter um, and we sent that letter to our union president at the time who we weren't even sure if they were going to support us because we had had almost no communication with our association, right? We weren't sure if they were like Mike McCormick. I had no idea if he was going to be homophobic or what his, what he was going to be like, right? And when um, you said you, you wrote a letter, not necessarily just you, but are you talking about uh, LGBT members of Toronto Police Services? Yes. Yeah, so there were several of us who worked, who were on our, we call it the Pride Internal Support Network now, but it was actually the LGBTQ ISN is what it was called back then. And so we all got together and we thought, well, let's post this, let's write this letter, how we feel, and we will, you know, basically give it to whoever will listen to us, right? And so we reached out to the association. Um, Mike McCormick was the president at the time and he saw it and he, you know, he felt like we were wronged, right? Um, and he went and read it in front of uh, uh, the, uh, basically like a, at a city council meeting or something like that, uh, got a bit of press reading out that letter. Um, and, and, you know, it felt at the time, it felt gratifying for us. It felt like we were fighting back against this injustice that was, you know, perpetrated against us. And that's when you take things personally that aren't personal, that's how you take it. And that's how we all took it. But wasn't um, it personal? Because they wanted, you know, I don't think law so. enforcement I... not to be part of it. Yeah, and and sometimes it is so incredibly hard. Whether there are people hard. that are part of the community or not. Yeah, sometimes it is so incredibly hard to remove ourselves, all ourselves, our individuality from the institution of policing because it feels like it's so tied together, right? But, you know, I tell people now, I say, I'm always going to be a member of the community. I'm not always going to be a cop, right? I'm not always going to be a cop. And I wasn't always a cop. I wasn't a cop until I was 24. I had many of, uh, of fun years when I was in my youth in Windsor, uh, celebrating pride in Windsor and in, in like a ragtag, you know, all 10 of us in the early days. Uh, and then coming to Toronto and, you know, before I became a police officer, celebrating uh, in, a, in a more grandiose way. So then when I became a police officer and being able to celebrate that way, it was, it was wonderful. But I won't always be a cop. One day I will retire, mm -hmm. um, I hope, and uh, I'll continue to celebrate my pride, right? So, here, so here's another thought. Why do you think that, you know, whoever decided to make the, the decision, Black Lives Matter Toronto, Pride Toronto, the two of them together, colluding together maybe, why not say, uh, hypothetically, let's just have uh, queer officers, queer law enforcement, be part in, in their uniform, be part of the, the parade, as opposed to saying no law enforcement, period. I think because to be honest with you, Mark, I don't think the relationship was there. 
I know it wasn't there with me. It wasn't there with other members of the LGBT ISN, right? Um, it just wasn't there, right? Um, we hadn't invested the way we should. We hadn't, you know, if you, you can't hate somebody if you like them, right? It's hard to hate somebody that you know, right? Um, and so, but that was that was kind of on us, like looking back at it, um, you know, I wasn't a member of Pride Toronto back then. Right? So then why were there no communications between Pride Toronto and Toronto Police Services if if what you said just now, if there was no um, relationship building? The only way to build a relationship is to communicate with each other. Exactly. So why do you think there was there was no communication between those two organizations that are paid by Toronto City Council. <laughs> right. I I think so I don't want to like I will appreciate the person who was in this role before me as mm -hmm. the 2SLGBTQ liaison officer. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, since I've come into this role, um, I've realized this is like wow, this is like an, an this is a lot of work. This is a lot. And in fact, it's too much for one person. So um, that was one of the things that I was able to go back to uh, the chief and say, you know, we need another person, like minimum another person. And luckily, uh, the chief, uh, current chief got us another person. So it's myself and Cheryl to do this. But I'll tell you, we are like, go, go, go. And it's not just go, go, go in June, like we are go, go, go year round. Um, and, and, and we are like one of the focus things that we are doing, like I, I speak to, uh, many different LGBT groups, including pride Toronto. Now, um, obviously there's that unfortunate history that, that relationship repairing that has to be done. Um, and I'm, I'm more than willing to, to play that, play the long game and, and, you know, just be consistent, um, and to continue to, to repair that relationship. And then, but it's not just with Pride Toronto, it's with a lot of people in our community, right? Um, who feel that way and and just continue to, to work, right? Hopefully uh, just being consistent and being out there over time, uh, people will see that. But also that it's not just Rob Chevalier and it's not just Cheryl Taylor. Um, yes, we are the conduit, we are the liaisons, but that we are also uh, ensuring that our, our police service is being equitable not only when it comes to the 2S LGBT community, but when it comes to policing in general, that we're being equitable. Um, so are yeah. you, so I just want to take a step back. So are you saying that it was solely on the liaison officer, like that department to build that relationship between Toronto Police Services and Pride Toronto? Because that, my understanding is that, that department, the, the liaison officer, wasn't that old, like hadn't been around that much, like right. that long. Yeah. And and there is other, so it's not just the liaison officer. We also have something called a CCC, a, mm -hmm. a Chief's Community Consultative mm -hmm. Committee. Um, to me, I would think in, a, in Toronto, an organization like Pride Toronto, you know, sh they should have really been going after um, – somebody from that organization to have them sit on the CCC because how could we claim to have proper community consultation Absolutely. if Pride Toronto has doesn't have a seat at that table and right? I would think that Pride Toronto would want to foster a relationship with Toronto Police Services to make sure that there is communication yeah I I agree with you a hundred percent I mean I'm not going to tell them how to do their business but um, certainly it's something that I've... Somebody played. needs to. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and it's hard. Like, so knowing what I know now for Pride, like I certainly respect the the people who work at the, in that organization day in and day out. I very much uh, respect the democratic... Like I am now a member of Pride Toronto, so I go to the AGMs and... Okay, so let me um, stop you there. Let me stop you there because in, in, in 2024, mm -hmm. Pride Toronto had to repay almost half a million dollars when it comes to grant funding to the federal government after an accounting firm found that the organization could not prove it completed multiple projects with the money it received. Yeah. What And this came to light in early 2024. Yeah. Um, can, you so shed, it actually, can you shed some light on that? Um, so I followed, I, I think his name was, was it um, 
Kevin Hooper or Tom Hooper. I can't remember, but he was a member of Pride Toronto, did a lot of um, accounting things. So I was kind of seeing like he was putting out some some emails and stuff and sort of generating some conversations, which, yeah, came to head, especially um, at the AGM. That was really, uh, I will say, as transparent as possible, uh, was delivered to the membership, um, as well as large amounts of money, I think in the tune, like you may mention $500,000 was going to be paid back. Um, the people who were the decision makers, as far as from what I understand, uh, are no longer with Pride Toronto. Um, and, uh, you know, I, from from what I saw presented at the AGM, I feel like you know, there could have even been like a criminal fraud situation happening. Um, a lot of the times having been a fraud investigator myself, I know that sometimes restitution is unfortunately, you know, how we dan how we handle sort of quote unquote white collared crime, uh, which is what that would certainly be. Um, but yeah, um, you would need the complainant who in this case, I believe would be the Canadian government to come forward to initiate those charges. And I just don't think that there's an appetite to do that. And also, I don't want to speak out of turn and, and sort of implicate people uh, without having all the information. So, um, but just what was presented, like I said, at the AGM as a Pride Toronto member, seeing this, it, it certainly didn't, it, it, it left a, a sort of a sour taste in my mouth. Um, but I will say, at because I was present during the AGM, um, the, the board, the current board, as well as uh, the executive director, Kojo, um, were, were pretty transparent about, you know, that whole process. And they actually, in fact, you know, brought it up uh, more than it, you know, somebody raising their hand saying, hey, what about this thing, right? So they had a prepared statement, uh, you know, and and I think handled it as a new board um, representing, you know, an, an older organization had been around for a while um, as, as well as they could. So you being on the board, I'm not on the Pride. board. I'm not on the board, but I am a member of Pride Toronto. Okay. So you being a member of Pride Toronto, for, first of all, what does that entail? What does that mean? Being a member um, of I get of their Pride emails. Toronto. I go mm -hmm. to the special general meetings. Um, I go to the AGM, obviously. Um, and I, and they, I, they send out like regular um, uh, communications to their members, uh, to my, my home email address, and just let let us uh, let us know like the different events that are happening. Uh, I actually think it's wonderful what Pride Toronto has done the last couple of years. They have supported, you know, not it's not just that main money making weekend. Uh, it's supporting things like Rex Pride uh, in Rexdale uh, in Scarborough, um, doing things like uh, partnering with Friends of Hanlon to um, to make that really large rainbow uh, walkway leading to. Uh, Hanlon's Beach, which is one of the oldest queer spaces uh, in the world, continuous queer spaces. So I'm actually really happy with what um, Pride Toronto has been doing um, for the community uh, in, in recent years with the new board and the new executive director. Uh, and I and I like being part of Pride Toronto. So, so you being part of, of Pride Toronto now and being part of Toronto Police Services, how do you see that relationship going forward? Do you think that at some point uh, Toronto Police Service will, Toronto Police Services will be back in the parade, or do you think that there is absolutely no appetite and that's not going to happen? I think we have to do some work first. Um, I think that I think that you know we still have members of our community that aren't receiving equitable um, policing. We're, we're still seeing that a little bit with the race-based data numbers, even today. Um, but we're, we are doing a lot better than what we were in 2016. So, I mean, like I said, I have that, I have the uh, privilege of hindsight, right? Um, back in 2016, when carding was still, we didn't call it carding, by the way, it was, that was kind of a term that was picked up by the news media. But certainly when we, we say carding, we know exactly the type of uh, policing that we were uh, referring to and we see the data that came out of that awful awful right like it's just you know and and you know we weren't teaching about uh biases we weren't teaching about uh bias free policing right um and uh, um and it wasn't that long ago like 2016 was like 
you know, it was eight years ago now, <laughs> but I, I, it's funny because I, I have to be careful of my audience when I say, you know, it wasn't that long ago because some people are like, I was in high school. And I'm like, okay, well, not for you. Okay. <laughs> for you, it was an eon ago. But for me, I have I have clothing that is from 2016, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so um, yeah, it, um, and, and, and I recognize that. So, so people, you know, my age, especially remember 2016, like it was yesterday. And so they still have that trauma and that hurt. And, and for years, they, they knew that they weren't receiving equitable policing for years. They knew they were being discriminated against and their voices weren't heard. Right. Or weren't, they didn't get the validation that they deserved um, until later. Right. And then even when they did get that validation, um, it, it wasn't in a way that was the way that it was really deserved, right? Like people, like, you know, somebody really, like who is, who is fired for that? Who was, do you know what I mean? What were the ramifications for, for that long systemic discrimination that took place, right? Um, and, and I get that, right? So, but I will say time does heal. Um, but, it, but if you don't let it heal, if you keep, you know, if you don't fix what's wrong um, and you keep that trauma train going, then yeah, we we could expect to never get back into the parade. But if we make a genuine, continue to make genuine efforts and um, keep you know on this course and and keep looking at the race based data stuff and not just that, also listening to communities, right, um, and, and working with the community, um, delivering police services in a way that they want to see uh, police services delivered. Um, then, then we can, then the natural outcome of that is, yeah, we're going to have a relationship. And with that relationship, yeah, we'll probably be welcome back into pride because they would want to be it. They want to be there with us. So in, in 2024, you being, uh, you know, part of the, the police liaison officer team, uh, between Toronto police services and the, the LGBT community, how do you see the relationship between Toronto police services and the LGBT community, generally speaking, in 2024? Um, yeah, in 2024, I, I think it's getting better. Um, I'm still meeting people who, you know, I should know, right? Or, or they should have my information. We should have already, um, you know, so, but it's a big city and it's an ever-growing city. Um, there's organizations that um, that exist that I didn't even know they exist. And it, and it breaks my heart sometimes. Like there was... Um, we, we raise money, do many different things throughout the year. Um, so one of, one of the events that we do, it's called a, a first responder appreciation and pride night. Um, we actually do it with um, paramedics, police and fire. So the three of us get together and we, you know, have a fun night where we also raise money and we give some of this money back to, back to LGBTQ charities. So last year, one of the charities that we, that we chose, I'm actually not going to say the charity, but um, we, uh, fire actually brought this one charity to the table and we thought, oh, that's great. Um, you know, it sounds like they're a, a lovely charity. And then we went to present the check and I showed up in uniform. I hadn't had any prior dealings with this organization. They saw the police and they thought, what is the police doing here? And we were like, oh, backpedal. Okay. This is a, it's a first responder event. You know, there's police, fire and paramedics there. Um, and so the three of us come out when we're, you know, presenting these checks to the organizations. Um, and it was very awkward for me. It was very awkward for fire and paramedic because they didn't anticipate that happening in a thousand years. But basically the organization said, well, if the police are involved, we don't want to accept the money. And it, unfortunately, that is something that I had faced in previous years. Um, so it wasn't, so I, I tried to save face and and tried to, you know, didn't want, you know, our relationship or, or lack of relationship with this organization to reflect on our partners, fire and paramedics. So I tried to do a bit of damage control and sort of step back, but they saw it as like the police trying to use this opportunity as a photo opportunity. And I was like, oh my God, if you knew me, like that's absolutely not what I'm about. Um, but they didn't know me, right? So I don't begrudge them for having that opinion. Um, and it just showed like even in 2024, because that's when this happened, that we still have work to do. Right, we still have organizations and 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 things to reach, but people like you, Mark, who give us this opportunity to to allow me, you know, to, to, to you know, reach whomever we can in the community. I think taking advantage of of opportunities like this is is so important because it helps you know get that message out there. Well said, well said, Sergeant Robert Chevalier. Well said, well done. 
Thanks for your time. Thanks for being on the show. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you.